The Backdoor GA Podcast for 2023 is now brought to you by Steed Motor Group. For your personalised vehicle shopping experience, visit steedmotorgroup.ie. We are now delighted to announce our second sponsor of the podcast. Harper Finley are a professional service recruitment company operating nationwide and are dedicated to helping people find their dream job. So joined now by former Galway senior footballer Barry Cullinan and former Galway senior football analyst Stephen O'Mara to look back at Galway's victory over Tyrone at the weekend on a scoreline of 16 points to 13 where Galway uh, won out their first game in the All-Ireland series and now faced uh, Westmead in round two on the 3rd of June. That game taking place in Kizak Park in Mullingar at five o'clock. Um, just before we do get into the chat, if you haven't already, um, it'd be greatly appreciated if anyone can subscribe to this channel. It helps uh, grow and there's been significant numbers uh, viewing the podcast over the last few weeks, so that'll definitely help. Stephen, just coming to you first, um, I did mention there, former Goalie Senior Football um, Analyst um, under Kevin Walsh. Um, I suppose, just before we do get into it, did you, did you enjoy working with Goalie? Ah, yeah, it was a great time, I suppose. It was, I was sort of catapulted into the inter-county scene. Um, so it was a great experience, you know. It was a good bunch of lads. Uh, yeah, definitely enjoyed it, you know. Now I was working remotely, when I was at matches. I wasn't on the training ground. Um, I went over to matches every work during the week. But no, definitely too. I suppose, certainly since 2018 was, you know, was uh, was great. You know, going in sort of odds on favourites with the bookies to get relegated from the league and then go clean sweep to the league finals. Well, that was a great year, obviously. Um, every, everybody's happy you're winning. But no, on the whole, yeah, it was, I, I had had good times in Galway. How did that um, opportunity come about uh, for you? Uh, I was running a website. I took over a website that had stopped in Dublin, uh, Grassroots GEA, a kind of unique site, and that it reported on the Dublin club scene in quite in depth. Uh, and I took that over, and from the back of that, uh, Sports Joe picked me up and got me doing a f- some articles, a, a, a weekly piece in 2017. Um, and actually, the Galway Hurlers got me to do a little bit of sort of a, I suppose, a secondary analysis, probably late in 17 going to the all Ireland hurl semi-final. And from that, because they had an analysis team in place, uh, a very effective one, they recommended to the footballer. So I, I haven't done just sort of two bits as a secondary kind of analysis for the hurlers in uh, 17. I went in as the as the analyst for the footballers into 18. There was um, Cara Finlink there, I suppose, between Dave Morris and Brian Silk. So that's how the, the connection was made. Um, what were you uh, mainly doing w- with the Galway Senior Footballers just if people who are listening and aren't really aware of technically what a football analyst is? Yeah, look, I suppose, I, I, I suppose everyone does something different so maybe mine is slightly more unique. I've kind of got a, an actuarial type sit, money ball type software system that calculates a lot of sort of maybe unseen things through numbers and whatnot. That'll be one part. I'd obviously be a coach as well, um, so I would have done a lot of videos as well, basically look at the game. Now, look, part of me backed up off the numbers, like if you weren't scoring off a certain situation that was coming through the numbers, you'd, you'd tear that apart then to have a, a closer look. Or sometimes just a naked eye, you'd look and see if that doesn't look like it's working. Um, let's, you know, here's a video on where it didn't work or whatnot. And look, sometimes... Sometimes you'd have a, you know, you'd see eye to eye with, with management and coaching. Sometimes you wouldn't. I mean, it, it got filtered, certainly. Uh, but yeah, it was a, a good bit of commentated videos, a lot of raw data with, with a lot of numbers behind it. But I suppose the key thing, I wouldn't say 100%, but broadly speaking, any video I suppose I would have done would have had data to back up the, the parameter of whether, you know, it was a, a, a positive or a negative, maybe. What's your view on stats, Barry? And they're very important. Um, I think they're a little bit like sports psychology. You know, it, it's you either buy into it or you don't. And I think, from from my understanding, I th- or from from what I was hearing, you know, Kevin 
Kevin really did, and I'd say Kevin was good to work with, and that he, you know, I think Kevin put a huge amount of work into analysing both Galway and their opponents himself. I think he, you know, Kevin spent night and day on huddle looking at looking at videos. So I would imagine he was delighted to have, you know, an outside set of eyes like Stephen as well, just to either back up what he his thinking is or or give him an alternative viewpoint. So I think they're they're really, really important. Um sometimes there's a bit of you know, paralysis by analysis. Um, I didn't come up with that one there, and I've heard it, I've heard that before. Um, you know, I, like I think Pauri put it very well uh, after the Ross Common game. I'm not sure who put it to him about you know cutting down on Ross Common scores from from turnovers that they had against Mayo, and I think Pauri in typical Pauri fashion threw it back and said, "Well, they have, they have to come from someplace. They can't just fall from the sky." You know, so there's, there's a good bit of that in it as well. Um, but I definitely think there has to, you know, if you can get the balance right between not being over, um, overly, I suppose, consumed by the stats and the, the video analysis and you have a really good gut, I think that's really important. And again, like the sports psychology, I'd reference that with S&C as well, you know, that that yeah, it has all of the sports science is really, really important, but it, there also has to be an experience piece and a good piece as well. So that balance between everything is what gets the successful teams. I think if you have a team that has a brilliant analysis and a brilliant stats team, with poor S and C or poor coaching aspect, you're not going anywhere like like that. If you have a brilliant coach, but they just don't see some of the smaller nitty gritty bits, you know, that's probably not going to work either. So I think finding the right balance and having good people um, I think we'll all be quoting Ronan O'Gara when he talked about um, getting good people in the building and building their competence, competencies after that. I think if you have good people on your team, you know, that's that's probably most important. Um, and then good data after that is probably right up there as well. Before we do get into the game, Dave Stephen, something I wanted to ask you, you often hear GA traditionalists when people do bring in a stats team and even here at a club level, oh, there's too much stats players are playing with fear, They're, the management are just feeding them with stats. How do you feel when you hear that? To be honest, it doesn't really put me up or down because like, not unlike what Barry is saying there, like stats, it's it's like asking, is the internet good? You know, you could, you could go in there and give yourself a, a, an unwritten degree in philosophy or you could go in and look at nonsense videos entertain yourself and everything in between like there's good there's good stats and there's well uh, they're not bad stats as long as it's not false but there's there's useful stats and there's useless stats and there's counterproductive stats so I don't really it doesn't put me up or down again I, I'd emphasize I was a I, I was a coach for years and still am a coach and I got into analysis and I suppose I got into the stat side of the analysis which are two different things kind of related, but to give evidence to ideas I had and you try to quantify them, you know, I don't, I've not seen some really bad stats and some really counterintuitive or counterproductive analysis out there. Um, and look, there's not really, look, there's a, uh, Crow Park has a grading system for it, but there's not really a, form of qualification that's required so I mean anybody can go into it I mean and to compare it with medicine any quack can go into it as well as for a manager to decide whether they think there's value or benefit and like anything some have significant value maybe a few out there have superb value a lot probably bad enough maybe have no value some I would definitely I've, I've seen counterproductive analysis um so I suppose my answer is someone ever said that to me, no one ever has, uh, not directly accused me anyway, but if they did, you know, I would like to take the whole point of how I do what I do. I could give evidence-based data to show them, well, actually, what I'm saying isn't an opinion, it's a matter of measurement, and this has been measured and quantified. Obviously, there's grey areas in a lot of these quantifications, um, but, yeah, look, it's it's it's... It's a broad spectrum, and look, if, if, I wouldn't argue with people who reckon some of it is a load of baloney, because it is. Um, if people think that about mine, full power to them. I, I, I try and talk them out of it if they listen to me. 
you know, they definitely have had an impact and it's, it's a broad discussion. Um, you, you, you could go on about different things associated with it all day. But with that, go away, Tyrone game. Barry, you're on duty with go a day at the weekend. Watching myself to GA go, go I went out on a final scoreline of 16 points to 13. In Pierce Stadium, remarkably, they played in the league. Go with that Tyrone, 16 points to 13 as well. The conditions were nearly similar as they were in the league, but conditions definitely did have an impact in this game. If you look at even the Mayo Kerry game before that, yeah, absolutely. And and not for the first time, I got to Pierce Stadium or arrived at a stadium and went either way of bring my jacket or don't bring my jacket. The sun was shining. I said, geez, do you know what? I'll leave the jacket in the car. And it says about two minutes on the walk to Pierce Stadium and the heavens opened and it didn't really stop. It didn't really stop after that. Um, and it had a big, a big impact on the pitch or on, on the game. You know, not, a, not as much like the handling was still very good. You know, uh, people didn't lose their footing a huge amount. The pitch was in, a, in excellent condition. Um, but a bit like golf, you know, if the ball is wet and heavy, um, it just doesn't travel as far. So you were kind of relying on bringing the ball in that little bit closer to try and get some of your kicks off. That played into, not, not just Tyrone's hand, but it played into Gawa's hands as well and that they, they defend that 30, 30 metre kind of radius of the goal very, very well. And just with the conditions to try and get a shot off from 45, 40 metres was, was very, very difficult, which, which led to... Um, you know, I suppose a lot of play around that thirty meter zone for both for both teams. Now it also led to some good scores because they both had to work really really hard. They had to work hard to get people into position, and then Galway and Tyrone, when they did get them chances, they converted, particularly the likes of Darren McCurry and stuff. So, um, yeah, conditions didn't. I, I still, to be honest, I still enjoyed the game. I've heard a f- bit of feedback saying that it wasn't the best game in the world, but I thought for. For what it was and how difficult it was to play in, I thought the actual standard was very good. Um, I thought Galway's um, shot selection was good. I thought their decision making was good, and just a little bit disappointed in Tyrone and some of the things that they did. Um, you know, and I'll give you an example, and we'll go into more detail. You know, th- when they did work the ball and were patient, they got guys into good scoring positions, and they actually converted them. And then they had three, maybe four, really poor decisions. So. One that stands out in my head was they went over and back, you know, like modern day inter- inter county football, over, you know, back and over the pitch, um, recycled the ball. And then I think on the third occasion where maybe it was a little bit of frustration, Pori Campsey, who was, you know, left cornerback, came up the pitch and had a snapshot with the outside of his right from about 40 metres. And like, you know, the chances of getting it were just, you know, they were slim and none. That sort of stuff, I suppose, is stuff that will frustrate Brian Dewar, Brian Dewar, and Fergal Logan, and, and um, and and the Tyrone players as well. But overall, like I, I enjoyed it. Thought it was a decent game. Thought Galway managed conditions and managed the game very well. 16-13, two points on the board. They'll be happy enough with that. Just, just before you bring um, Stephen back in here, Barry. There's a lot of expectation with this Galway group at the minute. That, they're being talked about for a lot of people as serious all Ireland contenders. Was this very much a game where an obstacle was thrown in front of Galway again and they overcame it? Yeah, they won. <laughs> you know, like uh, I've had these conversations and, and there's, ex- there's expectations on this Galway team because they are genuine all Ireland contenders. And to me, the all Ireland winner is going to come from. Kerry, maybe, Dublin, Galway or Mayo. I think all those four teams, no one else, people have said Derry, Armagh, I can't see it. I think it'll come from those four teams. Um, so that means that Galway are genuine All-Ireland contenders. Um, if uh, So there is a level of expectation. And, and when we go to games, we expect Galway to be absolutely unbelievable every day. And that's just the nature of the beast. And that's just the nature of a supporter. We want 100 miles an hour. We want Mayo, Kerry, every day we go to, the, every day we go to a game. Whereas if Parry Joyce was on this pod- podcast with you and me and Stephen and we said, oh, you know, Galway weren't great, maybe not hitting the heights that we'd hoped, he'd turn around and he'd say, well, we got to a National League final in that competition. You know, what more do you want? OK, we would have liked to have gone on and win it. We went into the Connacht Championship. We won that. What more do you want? 
we've gone into the first round of the of the qualifiers at the group stages of the All Ireland Championships. We've won that. What more do you want? So I think we just need to manage expectations in terms of what happens every day. Granted, we can have expectations and lofty expectations of where we go in terms of the All Ireland Championship, but just in terms of judging every half of football, every game of football about where Galway need to be, we just need to probably taper that slightly. What's standing out for you, Stephen, from that Galway performance at the weekend? Um, not massively different to Barry, really, in the sense that for the I still have a perception that the vast majority of Galway still favour this sort of traditional romantic style. I want to be kicking 40 yard pass to 40 yard pass to 45 yard point shot. Uh, so I'm slightly surprised to hear Barry kind of saying what, what, what I had in mind, which is the fact that, like, it's it, even notwithstanding the fact that it was brutal brutal conditions um you know it was it was a patient game i mean i said it you know i i, I was only saying it here earlier i think uh in terms of the styles and again i agree i agree entirely with barry something i would have felt that i, I would have worked with Dunny Gall for two years as well um after galway and i always would have said to the Dunny Gall boys if you hold and this is, this is ironically actually is that I think Galway play more Ulster-like than Tyrone do. Uh, I think there's a misperception that I think Tyrone are an outlier in Ulster. Uh, and I think Galway's style now fits perfectly into the Ulster mould. Um, and I have always would have said to the Duddy Galway, if you hold Tyrone out long enough, they'll start hitting city shots. And I'd agree 100% with Barry. And look, 15 v 14, it's very hard in, you know, in a top-tier match to withstand that, never mind 13 v 15 for, for 10 minutes and the physical toll that takes on you for the rest of the game. So look, Tyrone were looking for a minor miracle uh, and I thought it exceptionally well to be so close with five, six minutes left. But like that, there was that phase. It was a second as well. They, they tried a ropey pass. So in that regard, as well as Tyrone did down the men, um, they did shoot themselves in the foot. Interestingly, as well, the stats I was looking at, I, I took the first 18 minutes um, and those would be again like again bear in mind if you go back a few years ago the average phases of possession turned into scores points at total was 3.3 uh, points per 10 phases the National League Division 1 this year was 4 um, now I suspect that by the time we've got more dry day championship analysis that could be gone up to maybe 4.5 um, but like Galway in the first 18 minutes before the red card had 10 phases and they got shots off on eight with six points for 10 phases. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. And there's no style of football is going to champion that. You know, that's that's off the charts kind of stuff. Now, look, I say off the charts, it's becoming more common, that sort of score. You know, Derry, that wouldn't be unusual with uh, Dublin on their good days. Um, but that, you know, it's an exceptional first 18 minutes and I would point out of the two, the two that they didn't get shots off were, you know, for me, absolutely inaccurate uh, readings of the situation with David Goff. He gave what I would call natural runs after you hand passed the ball. He called them obstructions. I won't get into that one. <laughs> I've made a page already today. But, you know, Galway were, at seven, Galway were actually at seven, seven shots from seven phases and expected uh, an expected score of 6.6. For 10. So look, that style, it, 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 suited, it, it suits Galway. Uh, it has suited Galway. Again, look, I went in at 18. A lot of my analysis probably moved it towards that style. Uh, I mean, one key, one key piece that it just seems like light years away, and we won't go to names, but there were a number of key players that I, I went back into games in 17, uh, 2017. There were a number of marquee players, and their stats were reading for every two line breaks or scores they had. They had three turnovers or wides. And like I'd have a one-to-one -one ratio there as a red flag. Um, and that was something that was instantly, you know, more or less instantly reeled in because lads got the data. I'm looking at that now, looking at Sprone there last week. It's unthinkable that that would be common practice. And if one guy did have stats like that, they'd probably jump out. Uh, whether those stats are being taken or not, I don't know. But if somebody was kicking three balls away to make two sort of line-breaking passes, it would now stick out a mile. 
Um, certainly would to me, but I think it would even to, you know, anybody watching on the stand. So that style, it's it, it suited. I think it suits. I think, I think it suits most teams. Um, it suits Galway. It it it, it worked for Galway in eighteen. They went away from it for two years. It didn't work. They're back to it. Uh, so it, that is the modern Galway. Uh, and as I say, look, they they did fine. It, it's hard to measure the second half. In fact, the second two thirds of the game, uh, they did what they had to do. Uh, ironically, well, there is a reason for it. I say ironically. They got less scores per phase uh, with the extra man than uh, a 15 v 15. I put that down to Tyrone, who I don't think are competent enough to defend the high line 65 metres. At 13 and 14 men, they had to defend off 40 metres, uh, 45 metres, which uh, I think you have to be very defensively competent to defend so high. I don't think Tyrone are, and it forced them back. So even down the man, they defended better. Uh, but ultimately, Galway did what Galway have been doing in the last four or five games. Um, again, I would have been quite critical of my own podcast that there was a lot of ball being kicked in where there was a sweeper and obviously Cobra's in there is tempted to try it, but ultimately you know, to kick six to the six away in the second quarter against Donegal, it made Donegal look a lot better than they had in any other game. Uh, we're lucky to get a draw in the end against Donegal. They've kind of reeled that in since and you know, I think they've won nearly every game, maybe bar the league final since. That's how they played the last day. And I think they were going to win that game regardless. The, the, the metrics were all adding up that they were they were well on top of that stage anyway. Is the biggest positive to take away, Barry? Before the game, there was a bit of criticism about Train Walls, but it was probably silly really in one sense, um, considering we, we are still a bit early in the year. But... Coming into the all uh, all Ireland series now, Shane Walsh's performance is is that the biggest positive you take away from the weekend? Um, <clears throat> is that the biggest? Um, no, um, no, not really. Um, I think the f- couple of things. I think the form of Peter Cook is hugely important. I think he ha- took a while to settle back into it, but there were pains. That now was- from Peter Cook. Obviously, he was tracking back, working really hard, and he has been since he's come back in. But is it contributing on the scoreboard now where we're reaping the rewards of Peter Cook? Um, no, no, not really. Well, I, I wouldn't measure everything but by the scoreboard because I thought Damien Comer had a really good game but didn't score. Um, I think he got a point from play. So you, you wouldn't say that that's the the KPI that you be looking for, for everyone. But I thought he... he Early doors after he came back into the team, he was working hard, but you could see it was a bit of a struggle for him. You know, just just looking at the game, you know, and that's 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 absolutely fair enough because you come back into senior to county football, it's tough, it's it's not easy. Now it's just looking that little bit easier for him. And I made a comparison of the day. I wouldn't say he's at this level. I I I think Aidan O'Shea is a really good footballer, but in terms of tackling, he's very very similar in that he's big, long arms. If he gets hands on. He's very, very difficult to break a tackle on, and he gets a lot of dispossessions. And he's just—it's just looking that little bit easier, and he's looking a little bit more comfortable. I think he's now a really, really important player for us. Um, Paul Conroy again, just so important around the middle of the pitch, and then we're getting some new players as well. So Ian Burke, really, really good. Um, again, didn't score a huge amount, but was busy in the time that he was there. Discipline maybe cost him cost him a bit, but I thought he was—I thought he was really, really busy in the first half. And then the form of Kyle Sweeney, Johnny McGrath, with those new players coming back in. And the biggest positive for me is Conor Gleeson. I thought it was his best game in goal for Galway. I think he's probably put to bed any kind of... Um, Do you see him as number one now? Yeah, he's, he's number one now. He was excellent. Galway's stats in terms of short kickouts, long kickouts were really, really good. Um, he was confident in everything that he did and he looked very, very confident. In terms of Shane, yeah, looked far livelier than he did against Sligo played higher up the pitch, you know, and, and this is something that I, I don't have the time to do and probably the willpower to do. But I think if someone tracked the Shane Walsh's touches on the ball between the All-Ireland final last year and the Tyrone game this year, where he received and where he touched the ball would be very similar. I would say if you tracked his touches against Kerry in the league final, against Roscommon and against Sligo, you could be looking at a line 20, 25 metres further back the pitch and he just doesn't do 
just doesn't create enough problems when he's that far back because teams are just comfortable with that. But when he's up top or when he's closer to goal like he was on Saturday, he causes problems. His freeze were good. Um, he just looked fitter. He looked like he was in better condition. Um, and we do know he was sick before the Sligo game, so we will give him a pass at that. But we need more from him. Um, you know, we, we need, if you look at, you know, what the top, top forwards do on consistent basis, like we need that to go and win in North Ireland. We need that from Shane Walsh. He's, he's a top, top player. We don't, we need him operating at the, the, the highest level from, from now till whenever the journey ends. His ability in the first half, Barry, I think it was, he got away from Michael McKiernan and Michael McKiernan was hanging off him. He, he was sticking to him like glue, but Shane just in that moment nudged him away and it was it was a terrific score he got in that first half, but that, it, was, it was very smart play as well just to give that quick nudge and then I think it was Johnny Heaney who found him then. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Shane's ability, something that I someone who uh, w- athletically wouldn't be very good. But uh, what I really like about Shane Walsh athletically is, yeah, his acceleration is is like off the charts, but his deceleration is is unbelievable. And the amount of times, even if you think of the, the game against Mayo in the league final, I think it was a Sam Canlon that was chasing him where, you know, he, he went, he burned Sam Canlon, but then he was able to just stop so quick. Sam Canlon flew by him and he kicked it over the bar. And his upper body strength is good too. So if you get in close, he's good at nudging you away. So he has, like, the range of stuff this guy has in his locker is is just, as I said, it's off the charts. And that was a, an unbelievable score. But, like, can he do the game? You know, can he do the game? Can he, can he be consistent over the, the period? You know, I think it was it... Lee Keegan said, "Like that, moments of brilliance don't win you don't win you big games. You know, you need a consistency, consistent over the seventy minutes. If if he can go to his optimum, be involved, be influential, like he was in that All Ireland final, then there's no stopping him. But but he just needs to do that, I suppose. And the players, players around him need to give him the ball. You know, get like, you know." No point in Barry Cullen being on the pitch who hasn't, like, you know, Shane Walsh's mobility in his baby toe and me trying to do something with Shane Walsh just standing beside him. Give, give him the ball. You know, just give him the ball. It's What it does then is it sucks opposition players out. They Like, if I'm marking Shane Walsh and we're not giving him the ball, all of a sudden I can say, well, I can step off here. If, if, if every time Galway is Shane Walsh is close by, we're popping him the ball. Whoever's on him has to push on him. If they're double teaming him, they have to push on him and it creates a little bit more space up the pitch. So it's just important that we, we make sure he's in the game as often as possible as well. That what, is that what needs to happen and do you feel Stephen with Shane Walsh? Um, I think that just Shane, anybody, you can try and force it too much as well. I suppose everybody has a role in the team and you know, a position, albeit a lot of the positions are more vague these days. Um, look, I think Barry alluded to it there. I mean, Shane Walsh had an incredible All Ireland final, um, but like nobody has games like that week in, week out. Like he kicked six points, if I remember correctly, from play, and on average, they were probably less than 50 percenters for you know, an average, play, an average, uh, an average All Ireland final player. You, you don't have those games every day. Now, I haven't got the data on it because obviously, you know, you, you you need to be working full time with somebody to be taking every touch. Um, but I suspect just watching with Kim McCood and with Galway, I'd say taking freeze aside because a lot of the freeze are gimmies. From play, I'd say he's done well if he scored 50% of the shots uh, since the all Ireland final last year. And um, now I suspect that's lower than what, you know, we would normally come out with. But... He does look. He does have a habit of hitting low percentage shots. Um, you know, um, he can score them more than other people. And you know, maybe and I, I, notably for me, I mean, uh, I wouldn't have said he had an exceptional game against her own. So decent game, but I mean, his first two plays, the ball, won, he shot a free that looked outside his range uh, into the keeper's hands, and then he shot one wide under pressure three minutes later. So straight away as an analyst, I'm thinking well, he's, he's got to score two or three or line break to Do you need to take some of those risks when obviously there's a blanket defence set and you, you're not encouraging your players, but do you not need to 
get your players sometimes to take these risks? Again, the answer of the of the professional analyst would be it has to be the right percentage, you know. Um, and for me, look, it can, depends on various metrics. Like in an ideal world, you'd say you wouldn't want to take less than a 70% shot. Uh, you certainly don't want to be taking anything less than a 50 or 55% shot. Uh, occasionally, like Shane does even lower, well, again, even lower than 50% for himself. What might be a 40% shot for somebody else could be a 70% shot for Shane. Um, but like, now, again, as, as a principle, I think Galway, I think the data has shown Galway are good enough to keep the ball through the hands, even if it takes two, two and a half minutes and get the score. No, certainly my uh, analytics wouldn't suggest us try a wild shot from 50 yards under pressure. Um, now, I'm not saying he did that. I'm only saying that on the whole. I thought he was, I thought he was, he was reasonable without having the that in the back of the up, being honest, I really only examined the first 18 minutes of the game when I watched it live. Uh, but when I went back going through it with a fine tooth comb, I don't know what's the first 18 minutes, which is maybe has those two missed shots more to the forefront of my head. Listen, he's a, he's a raw talent, athleticism is phenomenal on his days. I suppose something I would, I would see uh, again, kind of double up what Barry was saying, like. My experience, I suppose, that I would have had without going into too fine a detail. What I generally see is, you know, Burke and Comer were, you know, if, I, if average was here, Burke and Comer were always up here. And it was rarely one of them didn't hit that, you know, really high above average, really high. Whereas Shane Walsh's figures could swim definitely on his days. There was nobody to match them, but there would have been days then as well. And there are days where it goes down. So is it game dynamics? Is it, is it lady luck the way it swings? If he tries those six shots, he hit the other final again on a bad day. Does he put four wide? I, I, I don't know. But I wouldn't be paying too much attention yet to, you know, the, the, the harder the ground and the drier the day, the more Shane Welsh is going to excel. Um, yeah, look, it's, he's, he's doing okay. But there's, he knows himself as well. There are bigger days ahead that he'll be judging on. Barry, just in that open half goal after 15 minutes, 5-3 up, then comes Frank Burns, straight red, which there's no arguments really, and he, he catches Jack, Jack Glynn quite nastily. Then Niall Morgan comes out, possibly goes up for the ball, comes down on uh, Johnny Heaney, then you're thinking, will he get a card for that? But he comes out then, um, Ian Burke commits a foul on one of the Tyrone players, now Morgan then gets a black card for back chest uh, to the referee. In that period, the goal go after Tyrone with 13 men, or because we did really see in this period when Tyrone were 13 men at in the second period of the first half that they did seem to manage it well. Yeah, they managed really well, and Peter Hart went in goal. And in reality, that it just didn't play with keeper. Um you know, so it, it was to a certain extent they were down one out the pitch. You know, Peter Hart pushed, everyone pushed and got involved. And the ironic thing, as I said this to you before, Tyrone won all of their long kick won all of their kickouts when Peter Hart was in goal. So every single one, I think he'd four, it was four from four. So he'll be happy enough with his stats uh going back on the bus on, on Saturday evening. But yeah, like you can argue that that Goa didn't squeeze, but they were still still went in four points up. Like it was still a a, a decent a decent lead at half time. And how much do you squeeze? Like they were they were getting thirteen behind the ball. Um, you know, is 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 it much easier to play instead of Tyrone having one up top and playing thirteen behind the ball? They now just have thirteen behind the ball. You know, and that's still really really difficult to break down. I would say that you know Galway managed Tyrone offensively really well in that period. I don't think Tyrone had any chance um, or, or created Galway any any problems in that period. So it's just, whatever way you look at it, there's ways of, of maybe being a little bit concerned or there's ways of being really, really positive. I think, you know, Galway managed that particular period of time, I thought relatively okay, and so did Tyrone, but that's fine. I think in the bigger picture, and <clears throat> um, sometimes, you know, I'm... Uh, do the, the Goa Bay stuff regularly and uh, you'd sometimes question whether you know anything about it at all but uh, um, then you get these moments where you go geez do you know what sometimes I, I don't talk a lot of 
bullshit. But uh, on a fr- on Friday evening, I was doing a preview of the game and I spoke about Tyrone's discipline and how I felt it was going to be a big issue. And then, like, I, I, because, because, and the reason I said that, I thought the discipline in Tume in the league was shocking. Um, I don't think that anyone sent off. I don't think that anything too malicious, but just stupid stuff. And I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. In that game in Tume, I had Con Kilpatrick down for seven fouls. Now, that's like unheard of and I, I don't know how he lasts the whole game his tackling was poor like silly silly stuff he had five fouls on Saturday evening so like did he did he not learn that you just can't do that then the Nile Morgan thing stupidity like what, what was he, he lucky doing? to get away with one day on Johnny Heaney mm, look if it was Conor Gleeson that came and did it I and I'd argue that it was he was well within his rights. So I'm not I'm not going to look okay. at that. But the whole but the whole thing of like the remonstrating with the ref, like come on, like give it a break. Um, Frank Burns felt sorry for him. I don't think he's that type of player. But like again, stupidity and Con Kilpatrick down five fouls. And then I I'll, I'll give you another example and two two kind of con- contradictions in myself. But a ball was kicked in to Ian Burke. Um, I think, again, it was Parry Campsy. The ball kicked into Ian Burke. He was coming out towards the 45. The ball was dribbling along the ground. He went down to pick it up, and Parry Campsy came in behind him and like took him out of it. Three, the goal got a score from it. On the reverse of that, a ball was kicked into Darren McCurry, I think it was, in the second half. Carl Sweeney was marking him, or Darren Canavan. Carl Sweeney was marking him and you know let him get his hands off disciplined in the tackle, took the ball off him, up the pitch, Galway got a score. So I just think if Tyrone are to go anywhere, they've got to sort their discipline out. Just in that first half as well, Barry, was did Dylan McHugh change? Was that a tactical change or was it an injury to him? I know, I saw, I think it was, was it Woolley or someone that, that tweeted about he loved because yeah. it was Dylan McHugh's man that was sent off, they put on Rob Finnerty and took off Dylan McHugh. Dylan McHugh came over to the line beforehand just chatting to the physio on the dock, I, he had a knock. Um, he 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 definitely because you don't take Dylan McHugh off. Like if that's something you were going to do, you you put someone else. You you do something else because he's just so important to this Galway team. Um, but yeah, but, did it look serious? No, it, it to me it looked like kind of an Achilles calf kind of an issue. But I I would imagine he's okay. Um, um, but he's he's so important to this Galway team, and he offers such an attack and threat coming from a deep runner that you, you keep Dylan McHugh on all day and as I said like we haven't heard how Jacqueline is we would be hoping that both of them are, are fit and, and rare to go yeah it, it'll be interesting to see with Jacqueline um, it probably didn't look too good for it Joyce said he is hopeful but that Jacqueline was going for a scan so I'm sure the results of that will be out in the next few days to, um, to see whether It'll be available for guys next game against Westmead, as I mentioned earlier. Stephen, is it fair to say, really, if you're looking at the game as a whole, that Galway, that Galway are really never going to lose that game at, at any stage? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I mean, when I, as I say, when I look back retrospectively on the stats, even at the point of a red card, Tyrone were having trouble on the kickouts, did one three, lost three. Uh, the Galway had been forced long twice but one of them they were always likely to win they'd won three lost one I, I felt it was probably going to stay that way maybe Galway winning 75% of the kick out to throw winning 50% that's the way it was looking as I say the stats you'd, you'd go away at, you know taking out those two peculiar calls well calls I disagree with the David Goff made um you know, they'd, they'd expect a score of 6.6 points per 10 phases to Tyrone's 4.7. And for, so even at 18 minutes, looking back retrospectively at the data, yeah, it looked to me like a game Galway were going to win. Uh, and from the time, look, as I say, Tyrone did really, really well to keep it competitive and stay in it, but you still never felt... It's just that they're, they're too well-structured now. Um, you know, there's they're too... They're, it's not even, t- even five, ten years ago, 14 v 15, might not always have made that much of a difference. I mean, it would make a difference, but it was games were a lot more helter skelter now. Peter playing with width and height. It's, it's hard to fill the void of that extra man against a good team. And it just never looked like, oh, we were any less than comfortable, to be honest with you, from 
you know, even let's say, even, I, I thought Toronto did a really good job on the 10 minutes and 13 men. They managed it really well. But second half, you still just never felt that I never had any evidence that Toronto, unless they were to send a long ball in and get a, you know, get a, get a goal on a bounce or something. Uh, no, I never felt there was any doubt that the goal we were going to win it. With that as well, Stephen, there were stages in the second half where Tyrone bring it back to two points, go it stretch it out to three or four points. It just seemed to really be a pattern of that second half. Yeah, and again, look, there was there was such a high uh, phase of possession to scores as well. I mean, I'm looking here from the rest of the game. I mean, what have we got? Uh, got yeah, look, go we've scored four point two points per ten phase. It's around four point one from the from the point of the red card. So it's high, it's high enough scoring. So it wasn't a case that, you know, one team would score and there wouldn't be another score for six or seven phases. That there would scores nearly every second phase. Um, as I say, you know, and I, I also felt any time to throw and go back to two points, the Galway scorer seemed to come really easy. Uh, they kind of, you know, you got to send this right back down the hatches here, make sure this one, don't take any chances. And up they went. Uh, it did really feel like it just kept them at arm's length. Um, and that, you know, even if Toronto had got a goal with 20 minutes left, maybe to draw level, mate. You know, I still take off. Oh, probably would have won by two or three. That's certainly the way it looked. Exactly, Barry, when there was questions asked of them in the second half, the character was there to pick it out. They've done it all year. <clears throat> um, look at the look at the Tyrone game in the league where they were well up again. Tyrone came back, you know, one point in it. Matthew Tierney comes with a couple of big plays, go and push on and, and get a couple of scores. Look at the Ross Common game in the championship. You know, we were leading at half time. Second, you know, ten minutes into the second half, was it level or you know, Ross they were winning by a point, whatever it is again, weathered the storm, couple of big plays, got the scoreboard taken over again and, and won and won comfortably. And I could go on. There's been games constantly in this party choice period where they they you know, they, they come under the cash and they just don't go behind. And that's a big, big thing. And it'll be interesting to see at some stage, you know, nothing jumps out to me now of a game where Galway are chasing. Um, but at some stage, Galway will be behind in a game. And can they go, can they go and claw a lead back and then go and take a win from that? That'll be interesting to see. But you no, know, it it's a real positive trait in this Galway team that when, when, when a team gets a period of dominance, Yep, they get a couple of scores. Yeah, they put Galway under pressure, but Galway respond really, really well. And again, they did it on Sunday, on Saturday evening. But, but to me, that that's not a surprise with this Galway team. Where is that trait coming from, or how how do you feel it's being built, Barry? Confidence, you know, experience, really good players, the likes of Paul Conroy there, who comes with a big play. Um, you know, they win freeze. Their game management is good. You know, there's cuteness as well. You know, they they just they're doing all the right things. Um, you know, and they they've in they're a very very good team, but they've individual brilliance as well all the way through the pit. So Sean Kelly will do something, John Daly, Paul Conroy, Shane, Damien, someone will do something that just gets Galway back into the groove of things. Gets a free Matthew Tierney will kick a free. Something will happen that will just get the scoreboard ticking over again. The guy who took the fight to them, Tyrone. Um, Tyrone on Sunday or Saturday evening was Carl Sweeney. I thought he was absolutely outstanding. I found that there would have been a question with Carl Sweeney. He was probably only really seen as maybe a wing back, slash wing forward, but to come in at cornerback and play such a significant role, he just fitted in seamlessly. He was outstanding. Everything he did was brilliant. He took the fight to Tyrone. His ability to carry the ball, his pace, his decision making, excellent. Now I gave him, gave him man of the match. Obviously, Paul Conroy most certainly could have got it as well, but um, I've probably given Paul enough of them. So um, I, I gave to Carl Sweeney. I thought he, was, thought he was really, really good and just looked so, so confident. I would say he's a guy that's going to have to, he's going to have to start, you know, and that might mean someone's going to lose out. You can probably see with Sweeney this year, there's, he's been there now for a good few years on the board. So there's, there's obviously for him, I'd say, a real hunger enough to break into this 15 because he has been in and out of stages. Yeah, but what, like, yeah, there's hunger. But, like, if you're a manager, <clears throat> you're looking at certain things, right? First and foremost, Carl Sweeney would have been absolutely, he'd have been really disappointed not to start against Roscommon. But yet, 
didn't let that affect his performances when he's come in. And then when he came in, did really well. Didn't start against Sligo, came in, did really, really well. Didn't start against Tyrone, came in, did really, really well. So the big thing is that's a great a sign of a really good attitude. He's not down tools. He's not, you know, he doesn't have any, he's not sulking. He's just a really good attitude. He's get up and get at it. And like, you, you can't buy that. You know, that's that's the stuff that, that makes really good panels and really good teams. Cole obviously won that game out uh, in the end by uh, three points. Stephen, just about this to you, I suppose, because at the minute, if you're asking people from go, there's an expectation there, and a lot of sporters will feel that we should and will be there on, on all our final day. But obviously, there's, there's, there's a long way to go to that phase yet. But for you and from the different teams you've seen and the statistics that have been built up, do you see Galway being there? Yeah, um, again, I, I wouldn't disagree that for me, Dublin, Kerry, Galway, Mayo, I, 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 I think it's hard to see it coming from outside of there at the moment, to be honest with you. Um, what I will say, and it's not to, not to rain in the parade, Galway did get a nice draw to the honour of the final last year. Um, you know, they didn't beat a top four team to get to the honour of the final. So it's not necessarily a case that that's a par. Of, you know, still have to be uh, a carry or double in championship football um, in, in this current era. Uh, so that's something that has to be proven. Um, can it be done? I think if Galway played Kerry next Sunday, I think if they stuck with the parameters I've seen in the last three or four games, I would fancy Galway. Um, I definitely think they can be there. I think they're very close. There's obviously little dynamics. Luck has to go your way. Um, but I think if the four best teams get to the semi-final, it's going to be Dublin, Kerry, Galway, Mayo. If you were to ask me right now, there's a side to me. There is a good to me that nearly has Galway at the top of that. Um, Again, I will make the point, I don't want to labour the point, uh, not here, but in general, they, you know, kicking balls into blanket defences hasn't been good business for them. It's not good business for most teams. Kerry, in the honour of the final last year against Galway, ironically, was an outlier that it worked for them. And it would be suicide if they went back to doing a lot of that, sort of 10, 12 a game, because on average they're getting two, three points off them. Uh, where they're getting maybe five, six from keeping it through the hands. That's when they face blanket defences. If they keep with that, a point I made recently, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think Shane Walsh, Damien Coe, or Ian Burke were on the same field, certainly at the start of the game, since the All-Ireland semi-final in 2018, until a couple of weeks ago. They are three outlandish forwards. I used to make the point that the Dublin front three weren't better than that. In you know that, And I don't think people realise just how outlandishly talented that front three is. Um, I think the tactics are more or less spot on. The defence is statistically the best in Division 1 this year. Are M3 the best for you in the country? Sorry? Are M3 the best in the country for you? Um, well, I was at number one, two, three, but as a, as a front three combination, um, yeah, possibly. Look, what have you got? O'Callaghan, what have Dublin got these days? Man, you know, Callaghan and take your pick, Kenny, maybe margin. I would say it's good, slightly more experienced, maybe. They're, 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 they're tried and tested more often. You, you couldn't come and say the front three of Galway are better than that front three, but I, I think in raw ability, there's nothing between them. I think Ian Burke is a unique and special player that no one in the country has somebody like him. Uh, obviously, Clifford O'Shea, Geeney, uh, I'm not... I, I, I'm not on the David Clifford bandwagon the same as most of the country are I think uh, for all his talent his stats don't always stack up I think Shane Walsh even though his stats don't always stack up either they, uh, I think more often than not they do I'd, I'd, I'd have Walsh ahead of Clifford personally I'd have Burke ahead of anybody um, uh, Comer you know he's very similar to Con O'Callaghan maybe marginally O'Callaghan yeah they've a savage they've, they've treated they've, they've as good a front three as there is in the country. The defensive stats are outrageous. You look at it structurally, when you break it down, it's 
they're doing things nobody else is doing, trapping teams down the corner, but really effectively. That's come into modern football. You see Armad Derry really trying to go hard at it, but Galway are doing it more successfully than anybody. Um, so I think they really can be there. Again, uh, I, I, I still... I do uh, one thing I would maybe go a different avenue to Barry. I, I still think, I mean, one of the I look at with kickouts, I'd always have sang Stephen Cluxon's praises because he clipped short ones that nobody else did and they maybe went unnoticed compared to just banging them long. Uh, even the other, even the last day I felt when you broke it down, a few of the ones that were set long into the melting pot, God, we had a 4v3 in the full back line. You know, you go into the melting pot against Dublin, Stephen Cluxton will hit those. Um, if Galway aren't, they're giving away an edge. I think maybe Shane Ryan is more, is more likely to hit those as well. Um, that's somewhere maybe they're a little bit down compared to the, the some of the top three, four. Um, but on the whole, it, uh, my gut maybe would say Galway are the number are the favourites. But I suppose, look, the, 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 the bookies are rarely too far off the mark. They have Galway at Marginally behind me with Ford at the moment. It's still untried. It's they still haven't beaten Dublin. They still haven't beaten Kerry in the championship since 2018. So it's a whole new model. It's a whole it's, it's half a different team. It's a new model. Until they've done that, it'd be naive to call them the favourites. But deep down, you know, I, I do think they're really, really there. I, I think it's the best chance God we've had it in all Ireland in 20 odd years. Because obviously Dublin aren't as good as they were. Uh I think the Kerry, the 2019 version of Kerry, I think was better than the Kerry that won the All Ireland last year, significantly, to be honest. They just didn't face the Jim Gavin Dublin. Uh, so the field isn't as good. I think Galway are as good and maybe even better than they've been. So there's a real chance, real chance. Um, but I do think it's important to stay on the trajectory they're on, which is that more Ulster style, shall we say, where when they face blanket defence, their defence, they're prepared to cross over six times before they get a pop pass into Burke or get Walsh to break the line from the outside in or whatnot. But look, yeah, I, th I think there's a real serious, real serious chance for sure. What do you think when you hear that uh, of the goal in narrative there from uh, Yeah, spot on. Absolutely. Um, you know, my gut actually is I my gut I feel Galway, I think I think it's gonna take a serious team to beat them. You know, they're managed so you know, a point was made to me yesterday that how would Galway react if they get involved in a game like Mayo and Kerry on Saturday evening where it's up and down the pitch, it's open, it's helter skelter. Galway won't let that they just won't let that develop. And they have just a system now that manages games really well. And I think Stephen spot on when he said, like, we, we do play a northern style of football and we're patient, you know, defensively very, very sound. We break a pace. We have some top players up top. I think we have everything that, that we need. I, th I think we might need a little bit more punch from the middle of the pitch. That's why, like, I would be a huge fan of John Maher. I think he's done so, so well for us. I think he adds so much. He's just He's a really good fella as well. But I could see a change coming. I could see Killian going back to the middle of the pitch to give us a bit more punch there. And Cahill Sweeney then fill, backfilling that seven spot. It, that might happen. These guys see them train on Tuesday, Thursday at the weekend. They could turn around and say, if, if someone was on here and said, that's an absolutely ludicrous call. But I just think just might need a runner in the middle of the pitch or a bit more of an aggressive runner in the middle of the pitch. And that might be what, what Killian will offer. But I think overall, we're, we're in a really, really good spot. Um, other teams will feel the same. They all be on a real bounce after the weekend. Kerry will come good. You know they're still to the top team. Uh, Dublin. You know I think they are. If we if if we can if we can put our mass to the sword comfortably. You know more comfortably. I don't mean that we're going to beat them ten or eleven points, but comfortably as in like Saturday evening, where as you said earlier on, we never look like losing. If we can do that, I think we're we're. We're in for a right, right good chance, and uh, I, I, I just hope that we've a, a long summer ahead. Yeah, that, that, that's it exactly. And it's was me next up for Galway, and then I'm uh, to finish. Um, just before we do finish, lads, Barry, Dal Ireland series so far, there's, there's obviously an narrative straight away of 
why is there three teams coming out of a four team group? But so far, how, how do you think it's went? Yeah, I think I think Sligo and Kildare, or I think Sligo probably gave it a, a, the kick that it needs as well, and just that maybe maybe it isn't going to be as much of a foregone conclusion as as we thought. I think Cork and Louth. There's lots of big, really, really important games, and the top teams will want to top the group. Um, you know, it looks like my own. I would probably top their group, and that's that's a big advantage because you know you, you have a weekend off. It's a weekend less of trying to avoid injuries. Uh, you can re- recover. There's loads of positives from from topping your group, so that's that's really important. Um, you know, it's it's what we look for to a certain extent. You know, we look for the top teams playing each other week in week out. Um, I think it's really. I think the structure is. Excuse me. I think it's 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 a very good structure. I think it's a very good competition. I would have an issue with three teams coming out. I think it should be top team straight through, um, and they play they play whoever comes second. I just think that, uh, yeah, everyone will be going for every game, but there just needs to be a little bit more consequences if 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 you lose a game. Now that might lead to dead rubbers. I I don't know. I haven't given it enough thought, but I definitely think you know, we need to lose more teams in this phase of the competition. Yeah, and if I can come in on that, that's something I have given a good bit of thought to. I mean, something I find the GEA and maybe the Irish people in general, the GEA viewers, I think we get very reactive to single events that don't go well. And we had two Super 8s and both years there was a dead rubber in Dublin's group at the end, but there were two issues. Number one, there were only two groups. So when you had a dead rubber, it was kind of bigger news than it would be with four groups. Number two, you had Dublin were likely to win all before them. Uh, it, it just take. I mean, if Kerry, if, if Kerry, if there's only two teams going through now, that group is so interesting. Kerry, you know, they have to go and beat Cork. They have to go and beat Loud. Um, and, and I think they could have avoided with, with four groups. I think if one of them had a dead rubber at the end, uh, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. It's statistically unlikely to get a dead rubber in fifty percent of groups as we got in the Super Eights. It's more likely to be 20, 25% at most. And you could have reduced that further um, by if you did an ELO ranking, you know, a genuine ELO ranking, which would look as well, that one like the bookies' odds uh, for a championship. And you put the top two teams in each group playing first. Uh, and if you put score differences in a head to head, you could reduce the chances of a dead rubber at the end of a, of a group to less than 10%. I think, I think it was a really poor decision. And I do think it does take away from the excitement that would be there if if we had. I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking our match for own here. It'll probably both go through. It just, you know, the difference that game would be if it was two going through. Um, so I, I think it's a big own goal there. Uh, and I think it is something when they look at it, they'll probably change next year. For sure. And, uh, it's very much a case of... Uh, I do have years and seeing how this does play out. It is year one, and hopefully, if it doesn't work out, that um, alterations can be made to this, um, and they can get the most out of this all area series because there's some cracking games to look forward to over the next few weeks. But that's all uh, we have time for on our show for today. And uh, thanks to everyone for listening, and thanks to Barry and Stephen for coming on. The Backdoor GA Podcast for 2023 is now brought to you by Steed Motor Group. For your personalised vehicle shopping experience, visit stevemotorgroup.ie. We are now delighted to announce our second sponsor of the podcast. Harper Finley are a professional service recruitment company operating nationwide and are dedicated to helping people find their dream job.